We're going to take um, audience questions in a moment. Just one final thing, which is, as you talk about the uh, the brain huddle uh, in this book, and, and yeah. using that, one of the things that interests me is with these kind of more conscious elements of the way that we can try and look at the brain. How do we then right. deal with some of the the unconscious drives, the 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 sounds that we don't hear as we interact yeah. with the world? Right. Well, you know, as far as as young is concerned, character one is conscious and characters two, three and four are part of the unconscious. And so what this material does only because I lost the left, I lost the language, I lost that level of consciousness, but I was still conscious. So how do I communicate with other people about my conscious thinking of the present moment, my conscious um, uh, emotion of the present moment and my conscious, because I had to rebuild that emotional unconscious of the left brain. I had to reboot her and start her over again in order to be able to know, well, who am I mad at? I wasn't mad at anybody. I'd forgotten any resentments I had or any problems I'd had with people. So I was just being friendly to everybody. And people would say, you know, you and I aren't speaking to one another. And I'm thinking, well, I think we're lovely. Why don't we just like get along? Can we like let that go? And there go, no, I need an apology for you. And it's like, well, I'm sorry. I don't have any recollection about what I did. I am genuinely sorry. And you know, some of them forgave and uh, some did not. <laughs> it was really weird. So, um, so yeah, I, I think that we can live a completely conscious life and through the brain huddle where they all come online and they actually are inquiring among themselves which one do we want to have come out next by choice, by the democratic process inside of our own brain? As soon as that character four is engaged in that brain huddle, we're going to have a loving conclusion. So, so really the power that we have inside of our own heads is phenomenal. And we just got so much more than, than more power than we've ever been trained. Brilliant, thank you. We'll take the first of the audience questions. Uh, this is from Dom Dominic Domenico, uh, who says, uh, how do traumatic experiences influence in terms of switching off or just putting on hold some parts of our brains? Oh, you got to go back to the fact that everything is circuitry. Cells, every experience we experience. So your ability to wiggle your finger, that's cells in circuit. The ability to experience a trauma and then for the rest of the brain to say that we can't handle that. That, without, that one we can't manage. And generally, it's going to be that little character too, pain from the past. And if we are not empowered to do our recovery, you know, this is how we end up dissociating. This is how we, we freeze things. And that's why certain things will come up in therapy when we find ourselves in a safe place to go and explore. And I always tell people, you know, I'm the first person to say, never shut down your emotions because information comes in from the external world and it goes into the emotions cells of the limbic system before it goes into higher cortex. So we ultimately are feeling creatures who think. So you got to have that pipe open or we know what happens when we clamp down on that. It's like pressure builds up, builds up until it blows. And then, and then we've got something bigger or di more different to manage. But these are cells inside of the brain. And if a circuit, if a memory or a trauma from our past is so devastating and we cannot get physically safe away from that, then the brain figures out how do I preserve myself? Because there's a group of cells experiencing that trauma. Of course, all of, uh, of me is in the trauma, but only a certain circuit is focused on the energy of that trauma and holding it. And that's why I said, if I go through any kind of trauma or any kind of addiction and I go through therapy or I go through rehabilitation, that, that group of cells has to be online. That character, that character two has to be involved in the recovery or will probably act like we're recovering. But boy, when relapses, uh, when we're most vulnerable, relapse may well happen. So from your experience and research, would you say, for instance, people who've had childhood trauma, that it does appear that that, that left hand side, that, that critical side of the brain does seem to be more active and louder? 
Well, it has to be because any memory from the past is the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere simply doesn't have anything other than right here. It doesn't have a me and it doesn't have a right, it doesn't have a past or a future. So here is me in trauma, emotional trauma, and it's from my past. And I always encourage people, you know, do your work move into your pain but 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 doing our work is work it's not a lifestyle it's not a lifestyle don't get hooked in all that negative stuff pain in the past belongs in the past allow it to be in the past go explore it in the present in order to help a heal but don't move into those cells and let them just take over your life again because they that trauma is uh, some other time than right here right now Thank you. Uh, I hope that's answered your questions out there. Uh, Alex would like to know, uh, will you discuss more about how to develop right side thinking and quieting the left? Obviously not so much as people won't need to buy the book as well. That's uh, obviously no. quite a part of that. Yeah. Well, you're going to want to buy that book anyway, because you want to know who is that character. If you want to get into the right brain, when are you already in the right brain? When do you exercise the cells of your character three? What does, what does that part of you like to do? When do you, when you go to a ball game, if you're with your chums or, or then, then it's a team, you know, we're all together. We're all one thing. That's going to be the right here, right now experience. If you go into meditation, what's the first thing you do? Go to the breath. Breath is the first thing we do when we're born and the last thing we do when we die. It's a train running on a track. Jump on that track. Bring your mind to the present moment. Just think about the fact that you're breathing. Then change the, the amplitude or the frequency of your breath in the present moment. Bring yourself to the present moment. When we pray, we pray into the present moment to get into the consciousness of character four. When we meditate, we meditate to get into the consciousness of, pres of character four. So we're quieting the noise of the external world in that character one and our relationship to it. And we're, we're escaping the pain from the past and our fears of the future. So get back into the present moment and get to know Know your characters threes and fours and that's why this book is so beautiful because it gives you a thorough understanding about what is the skill sets of each of those four characters and at the end of each of those four chapters for character one two three and four it asks you very specific questions and i don't want you to just read it and blow it off i want you to answer those questions about yourself you have to get to know these characters inside of yourself or you're just having an analytic left brain character one read about it all and then making a left brain character two judgment about whether or not you like it or not because you fail or you succeed get the book work the material and it will change your life how much of your book do you think you could have written if you had not had the stroke would any of this existed from your previous research no, because, you know, what we knew before I had the stroke was kind of what's going on in the right brain. And we've got 50 years of, of research, you know, if not more about what's, what are the differences, not just in human, but in other creatures, what's the difference between the right brain and the left brain? And Dr. Ian McGilchrist, one of your own UK psychiatrists, beautiful book, uh, The Master and His Emissary is all about the master being the bigger picture right brain and his emissary coming from the values of the collective humanity and in relationship to this beautiful planet come from the collective and then you use the details of the left brain ego individuality language and all that skill set in order to be and make a positive impact in the external world so i think that his book is absolutely beautiful because he does an analysis Analysis and and really does a great job in the first half of it of looking at what what have we learned about research even in birds you know birds one eye is going to be coming in and looking at the big picture at that adorable you know yummy prairie dog and then the left brain is going to focus in on that prairie dog and calculate well how fast is it going and what do i need to get there and what's my motivation to get there etc cetera, etc cetera. so we've got you know just really since the 60s and 70s 
an understanding about the left brain and the right brain, what I bring to this conversation is the four characters, because it's one thing to talk about the right brain abstractly, but to have lost the left brain, to have lost the ego and to go and be that and to exist as that for eight years. And then after eight years, get an, uh, an ego and an identity back and define the boundaries of where I begin and end. You really get to know these are different consciousnesses. These are different groups resulting in different skill sets. Those skill sets get packaged together and that results in a character profile. And if you get to know all four of your profiles consciously and you can do a brain huddle and pull them all together consciously you're suddenly whole brain living and living a conscious life and wow who wouldn't want to be able to do that um gary has a question about whether uh, the influence of hypnosis whether that is a way of being able to get to some extent to where you're talking about safely and naturally um I think that hypnosis gets you into different parts of your your character. Um, most of the hypnosis I'm familiar with is taking people back in time, which takes them back to what was it like emotionally when you were five years old and what was going on, what was the dynamic. If you're going back and experiencing trauma, that's going to take you back into your character too. Um, so, so I think hypnosis is an interesting subject. Uh, I haven't had enough of it myself to be able to tell you if I get hypnotized, what part of my brain am I shifting away from? Cause that's interesting to me and which part of my brain character are you shifting me into? So I don't have a really good answer for that other than, I don't know. Uh, question from Joe, and I have to admit, I know nothing about this person's work, uh, but Joe was wondering uh, about the uh, work of uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett uh, and where you stand on that. I don't know Lisa Feldman Barrett. I don't either. Well, there we go. That's a, the, the, the quickest answer we've had yet. And uh, it was concise and true. <laughs> and that's very, very important. But I'm going to look her up. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, a couple of people have asked about this. I know that your, your, your father was uh, a, a preacher and I was thinking sometimes reading this book about a great loss to me that we had was the gods of old where they were so many, again, like kind of Jungian kind of archetypes you would have. And it, I wonder how much, again, the change in our experience of our brain is sometimes in this far more linear narrative of a kind of you know, the, the, the single god, as opposed to these angry, tempestuous, moody and lusty gods, which seem to have been a better reflection of who we actually are. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so I don't know, Zeus. So, uh, you know, all of them, I mean, it's like any emotion, it's, uh, you know, there was, here's the power. And I think that that's where it goes. If you've got power and you're giving something power and we need to externalize that power as a God or as a goddess or as a whatever, then, then essentially we're trying to make sense out of these different pieces of ourself. And, you know, I thought it was interesting that with um, existentialism and all of that coming around, what, 1850? And, and, and I think that that's what I've got this right. And, and, um, and the concept shifted from God, the, you know, wrath of God to God is good. And that that's only been going on for like 150 years. To me, that's mind blowing. Because, you know, I grew up in this consciousness where my father was an Episcopalian minister. And if, you, you know, that's one step to the right or to the left, wherever, of Catholicism. But in Catholicism, you have to speak through, you, you've got to find God through a, an intermediate, the, the priest. But in, in Episcopalian, we pray to our own God. And, and I remember having this, this conversation with my dad and I had to be like seven or eight because I was in Bible school and everybody thought the preacher's kids should like know her Bible, right? And I didn't know anything because I was right brain, you know, happy character three. I knew nothing. I didn't study. I was just playful. And, uh, and, and, dad, and the concept was that we are born sinners and my right brain, that just didn't work for me. no. I'm a, I'm a gift from God, you know, I'm, I'm this amazing thing and I never could buy into, I'm a sinner and, and that just didn't work for me. And so I started looking at religion 
and what my father's whole life was about, but he was also a psychologist. So he cared about helping people uh, and it became more for him about helping people and accessing people than it became about, about God. But yeah, you know, we all have our history with religion. Thank you so much. Uh, that that almost feels like now we've got a whole new conversation we've got to do for part two. Now we've opened up the religious side of it as well. Um, whole Brain Living uh, is out now. Um, I am back on How To Academy on Wednesday with uh, Merlin Sheldrake, who has written an incredible book about uh, fungus and the entanglement, symbiosis and many, many other things. And yeast. Amazing. And, uh, it's beautiful work. It's such a good book, isn't it? It's, it's, it's beautiful. Absolute Absolutely beautiful. So thank you again so much uh, for joining us. Have uh, a, a wonderful week. Uh, thank you, everyone, at the How To uh, Academy and all of you for watching. And uh, have a great week as well. Uh, we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.